In this episode of What Is Life, my philosophical conversation is with Rupert Spira, who I would say is now the leading spokesperson for non-dual spirituality in the West. And that's a view that everything exists in consciousness. Everything is consciousness. Everything is one. It is not two, not dual. Um, and he is able to put that across in our conversation with his characteristic eloquence in a way that is um, very vivid. Uh, the reason that I'm interested in this conversation is that's a view I held myself, but in the process of doubting my ideas and the evolution of my understanding of this, um, I have moved on from that. So my um, uh, contribution is to invite him to consider a different way of understanding the same experiences, the same existence, that we can understand from a non-dual perspective, from this univigil perspective, that the universe is not one, but it's the one in relationship with itself. So we explore the similarities and the differences. I'd say we didn't do so well in understanding the differences with each other in this conversation, but that we did very well by the end in understanding the similarities, because what I think unites Rupert and I so, lovely, so beautifully is that um, we both feel essentially that it comes down to experience and that the experience of the oneness uh, is one of love uh, and so we are able to reconcile our differences which maybe we were not able to quite articulate clearly to each other um, into love and that always feels like a great place to end a philosophical conversation I hope you enjoy Well, first, thank you for finding the time in what I'm sure, even with lockdown, must be a pretty busy schedule for you. Um, we've ended up at conferences together a few times, uh, but never really sat down and, and talked. Yes. And I, kind of, I remember uh, when we met up in Italy, I think it was, passing you for a moment and, and just remarking on that and us saying it would be nice to do that and me feeling uh that if we did it could be a bit like i don't know bringing together matter and antimatter and and because your way of being in the world is 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 uh, seems very um, still and studied and mine is what should we say excitable um, okay yeah. enthusiastic maybe if you're being I, kind I, I i don't remember the um content of our conversation when our paths crossed at italy but i remember the meeting very well the, the quality of it and that we um that you suggested we might have a conversation so it, it it's lovely that it's it's come about now in these rather unusual circumstances it is and we'd hoped to film in person in, in you know with in your house but but we're doing this instead and yeah. so what this what the idea of this What Is Life series is really, is just to capture authentic conversations. Um, and it's really an excuse for me to speak to people that I find interesting. And it's, that's mainly because it feels like, well, like with us, it feels like we've, we've both spent a lifetime now exploring this. Yes. Uh, both in understanding yes. and in experience. And it feels valuable to get together with other people who've done that and go and compare notes. Yes. Go, you know, what, yes. what, what, what have you made of it Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so far? Yeah. Um, and that's it really. So um, the, the question in the title is really just a place to start because it feels like a nice big question to ground in. So I'm going to start with that Rupert, if that's all right. And say, you know, what, what, what is this, do you think that we're experiencing and what have, what have you made of the life journey? When you say, what is this that we're experiencing? Do, do, do you mean um, um, that, that this current, that this current experience that each of us is having uh, or, 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 or do you mean more, more, more generally what, what is life about? Or, or, uh, I mean, I think I mean both of those. Both. Okay. All right. Well, let's take, um, Let's take the first question first. Okay. Um, because actually, your, your, your two, these two questions, what is the nature of this moment, that whatever it is for each of us, and what is life really about, really, um, they address the, th these are the two essential questions that are addressed 
by the non-dual understanding, namely, and I'm just going to reformulate the questions now, namely, what is the, the nature of reality, all of this, mm -hmm. and how may we find lasting peace and happiness? So th 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 these are the two uh, um, essential questions that are addressed in the non-dual understanding. So let's take the first question first. What, what is the nature of, of reality? And, and by reality, I, I'm not, uh, and I know you don't mean some kind of abstract philosophical reality. I mean this, that, <laughs> that, that each of us is now experiencing. What is ultimately its nature? What, it, what is the stuff it is made of? Uh, um, I would suggest, and, and all the great religious and spiritual traditions suggest in one way or another, that the, the nature of, of all of this is, is a single, uh, infinite and indivisible whole whose uh, nature or substance is, is uh, spirit or consciousness or God or what, whatever, uh, um, whatever term one likes to use, the, 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 the kind of scientific term is consciousness, the more spiritual term is awareness, the original, the, the, the religious term is God's infinite being. But whatever it is, whatever name we give it, and ultimately, of course, it cannot be given a name, it, it, it is the important thing is that it is, is one, it is single, reality is a single, indivisible whole, and it is not made up of any of its constituent parts. Uh, it's, for instance, when you when you look at a, let's say you're watching a, a, a football match on um, TV, you're seeing fifty thousand people in the in the crowd. But if you were to touch, relatively speaking, of course, touch those fifty thousand people, you'd only find one screen. They are all all the apparent objects themselves are a manifestation of a single indivisible screen. So likewise, all, all of this, the, the world. Can I just I want, can I just start, ask you to clarify that a second for me, Rupert? So, I really like the screen analogy, by the way, um, although it does confuse me. So, are you saying there is the screen which is one, and it's not made up of the things which are on the screen, and the things that are on the screen therefore are different to the one? No, it's not made up no, of them. No, no. How, how do you? I, I, no, no. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying. I didn't that. think you were, but um, do, you the, do you see the problem I'm having? Okay, I'm going to switch. And can, can I switch analogies? You can, of course. Because you can. Um, the screen and the image analogy is, um, is, is, is too limited. Let, let's take what happens in a, in a dream at night, because I think this is the, the best, all, all analogies are limited, but I think this is the one with the, the most explanatory power. Take what happens when we have a dream at night. Let, let's say you're, you fall asleep in London and that you dream you're walking on the streets of New York. Now your, your mind is, um, is a single field. Your, your mind is one conscious field. But when you dream, you, your, your mind appears as a multiplicity and diversity of objects and people, namely the streets of New York. So what is one, your mind, appears as many. Now, you cannot view the streets of New York directly from your mind asleep in London. In other words, your mind asleep in London does not know that it's dreaming. It has forgotten that it is dreaming. You, you have, your mind has fallen asleep to its reality, to its own reality. And it has not only imagined the streets of New York within itself, it has localized itself as an individual on the streets of New York. Now, from the perspective of that individual, the person that you, you seem to become, reality seems to consist of 10,000 things, the objects and people on the streets of New York. So from the location, the localized perspective of the apparently separate subject of experience in your dream, reality appears to be a multiplicity and diversity of objects and people. Now, when you wake up, you realize, wow, the whole dream, both the subject that I seem to become and the 10,000 things that I seem to be aware of, were all made out of the indivisible reality of my own mind. It's the uh, indivisible what? bit. Yeah. Because you're, 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 isn't, isn't the mere fact that you're identifying all those bits, doesn't that point to it being also divisible in some way? No, it's only divisible into separate parts from the perspective 
of the separate subject of experience in yes. the dream. So from that limited so, perspective... So, it is div- so if, it, if there's a perspective, it is divisible as it's, well as all it, one. It seems to be divisible because when the separate subject of experience, you walking on the streets well, of New York... Second, for there to be a separate subject of, div- of, of experience, mustn't it be already divisible for there to be a separate subject? Well, for, for, okay, uh, from the... Uh, Apparently, from the perspective of the apparently separate subject of experience, because your mind doesn't really divide itself into 10,000 parts. Your mind always remains a but single... it has distinct ideas. Like, that's a distinct idea. It, we're we're it, sharing it, different distinct ideas. It has distinct ideas. But if you, if you touch the stuff that all these distinct ideas, sensations, perceptions are made of, they are one indistinct indivisible okay. reality so from the perspective from the from the perspective of the apparently separate subject of experience each individual object all the people and things on the streets of new york appear to have their own independent existence but when you wake up you realize there were no things or people it was all the activity of my own mind now going back to our original question what i'm suggesting is that the universe or reality as we know it is the activity there are no entities in reality it is the activity of a single infinite universal mind or consciousness which only appears as 10,000 things from our localized perspectives now unlike each of us when we have a dream we localize ourselves as one subject of experience within our own dream I would suggest that infinite consciousness has the ability to localize itself as numerous separate subjects of experience, 7 billion of us or 7 trillion of us, if you include all the animals. And from each of those perspectives, it sees its own activity as the universe. Can I just say, and, you know, I've been around non-duality for quite a long time. One of the reasons I was excited about this conversation is that I, you know, I'm I'm not just trying to be nice here. You, you are by far the most articulate spokesperson for this view that I have heard. And so I, I really value that. Uh, so beautiful, beautifully put. Um, here's the irony for me, Rupert. Um, and it's to do with the timing, really. It's just so funny that, that we're, we're meeting now. I just did a... Uh, it, what you've articulated beautifully is, in including the, the, the exact imagery is what the contents of my book called Lucid Living and all of the books that follow from that. Pretty much. Slightly different twist, but pretty much. And I've just done a session with uh, some folks that I meet up with and talk, doing something which was I'd never done before, which was explaining why I now think all of that's wrong. And uh, how there's been this kind of... So kind of like... For me, what's happened is it the, the same shift that, that when I first got the non-dual vision and the experience of it, which for me was Nizagadatta and Mesh Balsakar about 30 years ago, something <clears> long time ago, <throat> after another part of the spiritual journey, and then bang, just like, oh, con- it's all consciousness. And just and then the whole experience of being of, of how I was interpreting my experience just transformed and I can get it now. It's like a dream. And then what's happened over the last period is I just kind of continued the process of unpicking my assumptions. And that's another one's happened. And it doesn't feel like it's a dream in consciousness anymore. I can get, I can be there and get that, but it doesn't actually feel to me now like, Oh, that is the best way of interpreting this. It feels like there, there, there might be, other ways, I, and I completely understand that what you're yeah. sharing is the foundation of... Can, can I just, just add one thing, Tim? Um, because sometimes people hear, when they hear a suggestion that, that reality or the universe is, is a dream in consciousness, that because, because our dreams, compared to our waking state experience, seem to be less real... When people hear the analogy that, or the statement that, that the universe is a dream in consciousness, they, they make the assumption, subliminally usually, that what is being suggested is that the world is not real. 
and that that is not implied in I, what I, I have thank said. you that is that is it, so it, good it, to hear you it, say it's that really important i'm glad you brought this up and it, this is something i struggled with for for many years as i think you probably know the first kind of 20 years of my adult life i was in a kind of classical advaita vedanta school and and some formulations of the classical advaita teaching are very dismissive of the world. They say the world's an illusion, by which they mean it's not real. And the implications of this is you shouldn't pay attention to it. Don't look after your body. Don't look after your activities. Don't look after your health. Don't look after your relationships. Don't, don't enjoy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I struggled with this for many years because, as you know, I was an artist and I loved things. I loved people. I love objects. I spent my life making things. Yeah. And I struggled with this idea that the world is an illusion. I thought, hell no, the world's not an illusion. My, the, my experience is utterly real it's what i didn't realize then was that to suggest that something is an illusion is not to suggest that it is not real it is simply to suggest that it is real but that it is not what it appears to be and i would suggest and and not only do the spiritual traditions uh, suggest likewise but also quantum physics tells us the same thing that, that the world that we experience is utterly real but it is not what we how, what it appears to be. The reality underneath the appearance is, is, is something very different from the appearance. So I think that that's um, important to, to, to make, make clear that when I suggest that the world is the activity of consciousness, or which is the phrase I use more than the dream of consciousness, I yeah. don't mean to imply in any way that it's not real. I think it is absolutely real, but that its reality is spirit. Okay, beautiful. And 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 so uh, I, the bit that the bit that's changed f- for me is first. Firstly, I, I'm not sure about even you know like like even when science says that reductionist thing when it goes oh, really this is quantum possibilities. It feels to me now like it is quantum possibilities on a certain level, but on it, on this level of what I would call emergence of evolutionary emergence, it's this, and that that we don't have to, that this has a, this is a level of being or becoming really, um, which has its own, it, it's not, it's, there's not something real behind it. And the, the big shift I think has been from going, is consciousness the right word? Now, I, I know it can easily become a linguistic thing, but I don't mean it as a linguistic thing because I think there's huge knock-ons from how we language our experience. The big change for me was I'm assuming there's a thing called consciousness as a, the word's difficult, isn't it? Because people use it for different things, as I'm sure you're aware. So consciousness is particularly confusing because people use it for opposite things. Some people by consciousness mean the experience you're conscious of. Yes. And some people, and I I think you do this, mean it's a a space, an emptiness or or a, a presence within which experiences happen. So for some people's experience, sir, for some people, it's the experience says, yes. which means that the conversations get very confusing. But yes. if, it's, if we take it as the way I was interested in it, which was it's the context, it's the, the, the big C consciousness, I'm not sure that exists. It doesn't exist. It, it is. Or, or is. Well, but... Tim, this is not nothing. There is something. You, you are. There is something being experienced now. Definitely. There is something. There is not nothing. Definitely. So let, let, let us let us agree that ultimately, that the reality cannot be named, because all names have evolved to describe the parts of the whole. So ultimately, you're right. We cannot legitimately give it a name. But if we're going to give it a name, what would be the name that was most accurate and, and not only accurate, but not philosophically accurate, but accurate in that it relates to our actual experience? What yes. element of our experience would that's, correspond? That's the yes. So the, re- so the reason why actually I use the word awareness more than consciousness yes, these days for, for the reason you... The reason why I would suggest that awareness, uh, uh, not that I'm particularly attached to it, but the reason why I use the word awareness is because if I explore my own experience of myself, what is the ultimate reality 
of my experience of myself. If I strip away everything from me, my thoughts, my images, my memories, feelings, sensations, perceptions, activities, relationships, take away everything. If I get undressed, so to speak, take off all the layers of experience, what is the one element of my experience that never disappears? It is the fact of being aware or awareness itself. So I feel that that's a legitimate experiential reason for referring to the reality of myself and the reality of the universe as, as awareness, but I, I'm not attached to that word. I, I can hear that, and I, don't, I really don't want to waste our time in a, in a, in a linguistic conversation. It's, it, it, it's just, I think, actually, that the narrative one ends up telling stems often from these, these choices. And that, well, I'm, I'm saying that for myself. So and what is your preferred word, Tim? How would you like to... Well, to, to here, here's, here's the problem I have. It, let, me, let, me, let me tell you the problem that I've seen in what I've done, and I think you do the same. And, um, and please forgive me if I misrepresent you in any way in the whole conversation. I, the whole, one of the points of having the conversation is to stop doing that. And that's why it's been great to hear the things you've already said. But the... The essence kind of goes something like from the, because we're both phenomenologists in the sense that we're going, look, let's go from this. This is what we're trying to understand and where we come back to. Let's. So I think that the, the, uh, the argument or the, the, the guidance goes something like, it, look, have you ever had an experience which wasn't in consciousness? I think that's a, and then from that, so everything is a, perception or conception in consciousness. And then the assumption that there is a world is an assumption. And um, I've, I remember you saying you, it was like a leap of faith. It's like a, it's like a thing you're taking on. So everything exists in consciousness is a perception and a conception. There you go. And that's pretty much in my book, lucid living pretty much word for word. And I think you've done the same. And then, What's, what I felt is like, ah, look, it, what I've done in that, or what we've done perhaps in that, is, 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 set, is, is offered a tautology and then a whole load of theory as an as a argument that we've gone, really, the essence of it is, have you ever experienced anything you haven't, you're not experiencing? No. And then the, with it comes the conceptual ideas there is a thing called consciousness and in it are thoughts and perceptions and the idea of a thing called consciousness is it's a thing which is which knows that it is by its very nature i presume so i i've come to question both those things is there a context which knows what it is and is there a simpler way of describing that and okay. so the word that i've ended up with is uh, the word being, because I feel like the experiencer, if you come back into it, is also experiencing things unconsciously, in fact, mostly unconsciously. And consciousness looks like an emergent property of the evolving universe. Well, if consciousness was an emerging property of what you consider to be the ultimate reality, namely being, in order to test the validity of that theory, we would have to experience or know the reality of being prior to awareness or consciousness because you claim that consciousness emerges from being is so, that true wouldn't you just have to be conscious of being but you're suggesting that consciousness emerges from being in which case there must be something called being prior to the emergence of consciousness yes that is implicit in your statement that consciousness yes. emerges out of being. Yes. How are you going to test the validity of that theory, given that without consciousness, it would not be possible to experience being? Well, with, with anything which you're, with any, as with any idea which is historical, you do it by looking at the evidence. Well, how would you look at the evidence for being in the absence of consciousness, given that consciousness is required to establish any evidence? Well, I would say, what is the one quality that everything has, whether it's conscious or not? It has the quality of being. It is the fundamental quality. There's no simpler quality than being. Being conscious is a pretty complex 
emergent property, which only some things have. Okay, so the, 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 that, property, the quality of being, oh, it's all yeah. theory. But, it's well, all an attempt to understand yes, but the, the, the question the, the important question is, is is it a theory that is derived from experience or is it an abstract theory that doesn't bear any relation that's what i'm trying to say about the arguments we've put before i'm well, suggesting I, I, that they are also abstract arguments actually and they're disguised as phenomenological arguments but they're not they're conceptual can you give me an example of some, something i've suggested that is abstract theory, not... Yes. There is... It, you, there, take the, the, that, that argument which I just laid out. Everything... Have you ever experienced anything which didn't exist in consciousness? In that question is the theory, there is a thing called consciousness which things exist within. Take that out and you have the tautology, have you had an experience which isn't an, an experience? Or have you had a conscious experience which isn't a conscious experience? Well, no. <clears throat> then the interpretation is smuggled in so that when you hear it, you're being told the answer. And then from that, once you've got that, then you can be told more of the answer, which is the thing which exists isn't the world. You're not experiencing the world. You're experiencing a perception which you think is the world. So everything, what, and this is, I've done this in most of my books. It feels like, actually, I haven't done what I thought I did. Now, that doesn't mean that that's wrong. It just means that I haven't. It just means that that is also conceptually laden. That's what I'm, that's what I'm suggesting. We, we, have to, we have to start with, with something. Yes. We have to, to, if we're going to, uh, this is something. It's not, it's not nothing. There is something that is. I'm completely with you. We have to start with experience and we have to end with experience. And here it is. And if we, if we strip our experience back and find out what is the essential element of experience. Well, didn't you just say it? Didn't you? I think you've already said it really clearly when you went, look, there's something, not nothing. Yes, but if, if we then try to, to be a so, little bit more e- explicit. And, but, and but, but you've already labelled it being. You've said there's something. There is an isness. There's yeah. a being. There's, there's something. Something, and now something take, exists. Now so, but isn't next, that immediately the foundation? Uh, but I'm now taking the next step, having agreed okay. that we are experiencing something. Yeah. Let's, try to, let's try to explore what that something might be. Yes. So then, I, I, what is the essence of my experience? So when I, the essence of something is the aspect of that thing that cannot be removed from it. So when I strip away everything from my experience that can be stripped away from it, what I remain, what, what I end up with is the fact of being aware. But well, that seems to me a good, there is an experience. That's tautological, isn't it, Robert, R- Rupert? I mean, because you've, you, again, what, I mean, look, I'm really, ins- I, I want to understand the same thing that I think you want to understand. And I think we're playing with the same experience about how we interpret it. So, but it seems to me, if you strip everything away from your conscious experience, you will be left with the fact that it is a conscious experience. You're just left with consciousness. Well, you're left with that it's conscious. Cause, but you're just t- left with consciousness. But, you, but that's because you couldn't possibly not be, because it, you're, you've, you're saying, take a conscious experience, take away all the qualities except that you're conscious of it, and what are you left with? And so, so, so there's no doubt that... that, that but what's it, but as, you see, as you experience a life, you realise, oh, I'm having a whole load of uh, information that's unconscious. You know, Carl Jung had that lovely image of the of the um, iceberg, where the conscious bit was just a tiny bit on the top, and the, and the rest, all that information that's coming in, and so consciousness starts to look like something quite else, not like the ground at all, but actually more like the sky, more like something that is it is blossomed into, rather than something where it's come from, where it's already conscious, and and why that matters to me is because if it's already conscious, you end up with a mythology of contraction or fall or limit from which you need to escape. 
if you have a philosophy of emergence and evolution where you take the simplest quality and go, it really looks like it starts with the simplest thing and then develops into more and more objectively and subjectively until we're here with bodies and psyches and wow, everything from very simple beginnings, you have not a philosophy of con contraction, but a, con a philosophy of expansion. And now, and, and, and there's also a difference then in how you perceive the individual. Because the individual then becomes the foundation from which consciousness is arising to allow you to know the oneness, rather than the contraction from which consciousness has fallen into, which is preventing you knowing the oneness. And that seems a big shift. Yes, I, I, I hear you. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and that's, that, that I think it, it, it sets up a different way into non-duality, which is intriguing me. That we could end up with a, there's something about the, the, the spiritual traditions, which, and you mentioned it when you, when you said you made a transition yourself, where, as I've studied them over all these decades, it feels like there's an essential negativity in there somewhere about human life. And in the extreme neo-Advaitic traditions, which are, you know, things that are going around at the moment, it's writ large. The individual is a, to be killed. It's, an, you know, the separate self is an enemy. It's a, it's a, there's, you know, you're, if you go to most spiritual, lots of them, you're, you know, all those things that make you human are in the I world. Don't. I don't subscribe to such. I know, things. I know you don't, Rupert. You I do, absolutely, and I'm not. I'm not for one minute saying you do because it muddies the waters. Neither of us subscribe to that. No, I no. Know. What I'm trying. So what I'm trying to do. What, so the reason I bring that up is because I know you, um, this is not trying to say you think. Why? Why bring it up is that it feels like what I'm playing with is another step. So you, you had that experience with your Vedic tradition where you just went, well, "This doesn't feel right to me," and you moved it on, and then I'm feeling like I'm trying to do the same that there's another step which takes what has been since the axle age quite a negative view from spirituality but within it this wonderful thing of awakening to oneness and this enormous love that comes with that we, I don't, recasting it in a different in a different language i don't see anything inherently negative about the non-dual understanding on on the contrary it it is the most it is the most beautiful, joyful, intelligent, loving, sane approach there is to life. It, it is basically saying that everything, everyone and everything, share their being. What, what, what we call our shared reality doesn't matter. Let's not... I oh. love that. What you just said there. I, that, everyone I, and everything. We, we are all... Um, however you put it, aspects of manifest manifestations of a, a single indivisible whole or, yes. or reality. Yes. That's all that matters, whether we yes. call it God or consciousness or being, it, it really doesn't matter. But what's important is that we not just understand, but more importantly, we feel that yeah. everyone and everything share their being. And more yes. importantly, that we don't just feel it, but that we lead a life to the best of our ability that is consistent with that feeling understanding. I don't mind if somebody calls it Atla or Brahman or quantum, quantum field or consciousness. Or, I, I don't mind what people call it. It cannot be given a name. Uh, in my talks, I tend to use the word awareness, as I said, for, for my own private use, I have to say, uh, I use the word God. I'm a closet Sufi. Yeah, I'm a God man myself. It, it, too. It, so in, in my heart, I, I feel of all, all of this as God's presence. Okay. Uh, I don't very often say that in public because for, for obvious reasons, so many people for, for good reasons have such an antipathy to the God word because it's been so misunderstood and abused. I tend to keep that word for my own private uh, use, but it, for me, it connects my heart to reality. It's not just all this is the activity of a universal consciousness. It, it's all, all this is like, like a friend of mine in in California um, that we stay with sometimes when we go when we go to California. Uh, on her um, kitchen sink uh, above her uh, above her sink, there's just a little post-it. It's been there for years. It said it says, "Remember, you're washing God's face." Now, I, 
I love that. Just, just like the Sufis say, wherever you look, it is, you're looking at God's face, this single, infinite, indivisible reality. That, that's all that matters. And that, that we lead a life that is consistent with that understanding. Beautiful. If, if you want to call it matter, uh, uh, that's fine. Call it matter. If you think matter is the ultimate reality, it's fine. But, but then if, if matter is the ultimate reality of the universe and consciousness evolves from matter, then matter must be the underlying universal principle of everyone and everything. And the implications are that matter must be formless, indivisible, and the reality of each of us. That's fine. Lead a life that is consistent with that, with that idea and you will lead a loving, sane, intelligent life. And you will be happy all the time. Beautiful. So, um, hallelujah to that. I agree completely with that, that that is what really matters. At the end of the day, that's what, yeah. that's what matters the most. And... I see us in a process of being alive. Currently, it seems like it's been, this particular version of it's been going on for quite a few billion years, and we're at the end of it, and it feels significant. I think that's another thing I get from all of my waking experiences and the experience I would call of God, mostly from the experience of God, actually, that, that Rupert really matters, and Tim really matters. And so the... You know, if I'm with anyone um, who, you know, the most important thing is what you've said. And like, it's so much more important. And it's so beautiful to hear you articulate it so eloquently. And, but this other stuff also is like, it play, it's going to play a role increasingly on where, where this goes. And particularly how spiritual, whether spirituality can, can play a role. So it, it feels also significant as well, but nowhere near as significant as love. And so, and I'd, so I'd like to try out two very simple ideas on you, just to get your reaction, which come from what you've said. One about God. The first one, maybe because I'll just try it out on you because it relates to what you've been talking about already, which is increasingly I felt like, look, the, the, this isn't one. This is the one in relationship with itself. That's what this is. And everything is that relationship. And that relationship is becoming. It's one being in a process of becoming. And that process of becoming is the relationship of it to itself. And that relationship to itself in certain forms is, a, is, is the subjectivity becomes conscious. And then through that subjectivity becoming conscious it can become conscious that it is and it does that first is on a physical level and then a psyche level and then if it carries on you can be conscious that your deep being is the being of everything at which point you're the universe you're an individual who understands that they're one with the whole universe which i call now a univigil that bang, you've come, and that that evolutionary process is what this is. And it's leading to this non-dual awakening, which people of pioneers have experienced for centuries and have tried to understand as best they could in their culture. And then it's up to us to re-understand it in our culture and take that, that process onwards. Yeah. Tim, I don't feel that the individual can recognize that they are one with the universe because the individual mind is by definition limited and the individual mind superimposes its own limitations on everything that it knows or perceives and therefore the individual mind cannot by definition know or perceive the whole or reality just as one who is wearing orange tinted glasses cannot see white snow so I don't think there's any question of the individual realizing that they are one with the... Can the individual put their attention on that formless presence, can, can which I, is everything? Okay. Um, as a concession, 
I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll say yes. But because we're trying to push a, a little bit. Yeah, please push like mad. I, I'd like to say ultimately no. Okay. So can I give you an, an analogy so that our conversation, uh, we, so, we, it's not, so it doesn't become too abstract and, and philosophical. Okay. You, you've probably heard me use this analogy before. Take an actor, John Smith, and he uh, is playing the role of King Lear. Now, John Smith, when he's alone at home, he leads a perfectly happy and peaceful life. He goes to his theatre one night, so to speak. He puts on the character of King Lear, yeah. which is essentially a series of thoughts, feelings, activities, and relationships. So the moment he becomes, the moment John Smith becomes, or rather seems to become King Lear, he voluntarily limits himself to the character of King Lear. He can now only have King Lear's experiences. He can have a, a relationship with his three daughters, but he can't, he's not Julius Caesar. He can't have a relationship with Brutus. Uh, he's not Romeo. He cannot know Juliet. He, he's, he's limited his experience. And he now seems to become King Lear. He has King Lear's thoughts, King Lear's feelings, he engages in King Lear's activities and relationships, and he suffers as a result. So King Lear, of course, John Smith represents, in my language, uh, unlimited awareness. King Lear represents a limitation, an apparent limitation of awareness. That would be each of our finite minds. So now to, to, to relate this to your question, can the individual know that it is one with the universal? To translate that question into my analogy, can King Lear know that he is John Smith? Well, he, and, and then your second question, is it possible for the individual, King Lear, to put his attention on the universal, John Smith? As a concession to King Lear, we could say, because King Lear is so convinced that he is King Lear, we could say, okay, King Lear, as an attempt to get you out of your misery, give your attention to jo John Smith. Try to think of John Smith, and that, that will take... King Lear out of his problems, out of his personal limited mind. That's the individual focusing on the universal. So yes, as a concession to King Lear's belief that he is an independently existing person, we could say that to him. But actually, it's not true because there is no individual person called King Lear. There is just an apparent limitation of John Smith. So who has the recognition, I am John Smith? Can King Lear no, I am John Smith. No, only John Smith can have the experience, I am John Smith. And that is why I, I say, in response to your suggestion that the individual can know the universal, I, I, it's not possible. Only the universal can know the universal. And you've just nailed beautifully why what seems like an abstract question about being and consciousness, why it matters. Because if you start from your assumption you end up there. Hang on, well, what is my assumption? That it's all in consciousness. That's not an assumption, Tim, it's an experience. No, it's not, it's an assumption, Rupert, because it's in something, but it's not, but you're assuming, because you're conscious now, you're assuming that it's the thing which you, it, you, you're conscious of, your being, is consciousness. Whereas your, your, the, the experiencer is also receiving information unconsciously. It's also there the whole time. It is what I'm, what I'm that's the, I guess that's the key th underlying thing is to, to, to move apart the claim that somehow that is just given, but it isn't given. It's conceptually laden. It's you, you, you're, you're putting that idea onto this and it could be right. But it is, it is, but if you put a different idea onto it, you end up in a different place because your place has been, there's consciousness, it imagines it's King Lear, it's not really, and, uh, and the, therefore it can't understand what it really is. The thing which I'm exploring... In, which, in the form of King Lear. In the form of but, King Lear. But John Smith can know very well. Sure, but, 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 but your analogy going backwards is that consciousness is the big thing, which is imagining itself to be Tim and Rupert and it's contracted into Tim and Rupert. Seems to have done, not really contracted. Okay, okay, seems John Smith to have doesn't done. really contract yeah, into it King Lear. Seems to have contracted into Tim and Rupert, and then it see, and, and, it, and, and therefore it can't know itself through Tim and Rupert. That is, uh, that, and that's what I meant by the kind of the, 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 the theory of contraction. 
so you're not really Rupert, I'm not really Tim. And that makes sense from that place. And I, I understand it, I really do, because I've shared it endlessly. But the other perspective, the one of expansion, of flowering, of, of the universe growing into itself, says, no, you really are Rupert. That's great. You're really Rupert. You're the being of everything arising as Rupert. I'm the being of everything arising as this strange guy, Tim, and I really am this, and you really are that, and hallelujah, it's fantastic. And then we, and that through us, the oneness of being can have a subject object relationship with itself and therefore can be conscious. And that's what's happening right now. And then because we are very emergent forms, it can even pay attention to its primal formless nature and enter samadhi. It, it, can, it can have that as a background to the whole experience all the time. And that is happening through Tim and Rupert. And the, the key with that for me also is like, is to say, I don't want to get into too much, but if you, from, from, the, if you, from the idea of, look, this is not the one, this is the one in relationship to itself that's its nature, then, then it's always subject and object. And that subjectivity has evolved into the conscious but, subject. How, how can that which is one have a relationship with itself? For there well, to be a relationship, there need to be at least two. Yes, and, and, and one is also but, two. But, I would say one, this is a unidual, a bit like the, the great symbol of it in the past is the yin-yang sign. It's that the one is two. That's the secret. That's the paradox. The one is two, which is why there is also this and why there is not, not just nothing, because the one is also two. And the two-ness is not a mistake or an illusion or Maya or any of those traditional things. It is actually the one in a process of becoming in which it is realizing. What, what, is, what is the one becoming? Everything. It's becoming more and more emergent. It's, it's what seems to have been happening for the last 13.8 billion years from our current analysis of people's experience collectively is it's gone from very simple beginnings, possibilities, through to a material level of existence and all of that for 10 billion years, 4 billion years of starting with very simple forms of organic life. And then the subjectivity is becoming sensorial it can it can it can have that object subject relationship with itself via the senses and then through the imagination conceptually and here we are I, yes and i i understand him I, I i would suggest that the one always remains the one it never becomes anything other than itself it always remains itself always in a new configuration but never being in a new configuration. That in, a, in a new appearance, always assuming... Yes, isn't that new, the same thing that I'm saying? New names and forms, but never itself becoming anything other than itself, but always appearing in new names and forms. Okay, so you... So and if that's, if that's what you're saying, Tim, that's beautiful. We agree with each the, other. The difference, it's again, is one of language. It's, yeah. it's almost like, yeah, but there is, a, there's a, there's, there is a difference. And the difference is in kind of almost like the tone of the words. Because... You know, when I did my book, Lucid Living, which is all about comparing the awakening state to lucid dreaming, it was like there's your essential identity, which is consciousness or awareness, I used, and then your, your apparent identity, what you appear to be in the dream, in this case, in the dream of life, but by analogy, the same analogy that you've used in the dream. Your apparent identity, but written in that, there's a kind of, that's what you really are, and this is what you appear to be. I don't know that there's any, there's, there, it feels like they're both real. But, but Tim, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, okay. I, I do so not why, mean why, why. Why. So, so if you're saying the one is in constant changing configurations of appearance, and that's also real, isn't that saying the one is in relationship to itself? Uh, okay. Uh, if, if that's the way you want to, to put it, that's absolutely fine. I have no problem. It, it, I, it's not the way I would express it. Okay. Um, but but I, that's not... You know, that, 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 that's I think the key thing is, to, is, is, where the, is, is where you end up with, with us. And then, that idea, and, then, then, and then the key, the key, the really underlying, the key thing which governs how, how we explore this idea of wanting to get people to a place and ourselves to a place of that oneness and love is 
is Rupert in the way of that or is Rupert the foundation for that? And is Tim in the way of that or is Tim, does Tim need to evolve so that he could become a stronger and stronger foundation from which I can be conscious of something that emergent or that deep? And that's, a, that's quite a different, and, and it seems important, no? Yes, I, I, I don't think there's anyone or anything in the way. It's anyone can, can just inquire into their essential nature and nothing, there's nothing in the way of anybody just exploring what they mean when they say I or me, or there's nothing in the way, nothing needs to be got rid of, nothing needs to be improved, nothing needs to be. But didn't you say that the, the limit of the separate self is a contraction and it can't, you know, that as soon as you think you're King Lear, you can't, you can't. All, all King, it, it's true. As it, King Lear, as long as King Lear believes and, and more importantly feels, I am King Lear, he is suffering. Whether he, he, he suffering is the inevitable consequence of the belief. So, it, so would, this is the message for me, me to take from let that. Let me finish. So, I'm so your, sorry, Rupert. Last I'm question. So sorry. I'm so, so sorry. So what, 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 what can King Lear do? Uh, King Lear can simply ask himself the question, but who am I really? What is the nature of myself? Nothing gets in the way of that yeah. question. He doesn't have to change his relationship with Cordelia. He doesn't have to stop being at war with the French. He doesn't have to resign as being the king. He, he, he can just stay. Everything can stay exactly as it is. All he needs to do is ask himself, but, but who am I really? What, 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 is, what element of my experience is, is essential to me? And, and nothing prevents him. There's nothing in the way. Nothing needs to be changed. Nothing needs to be got rid of. Nothing needs to be improved. Uh, he, but aren't, in that, aren't you saying to me, I'm not really Tim? That's certainly the way I would have phrased it to myself. Previously. No, I, I would say, Tim, you are really Tim. Yeah. But the reality of Tim is this indivisible infinite yes. whole and the tim is one of its many names yes like just yes. like king lear is one of the many names of john smith tomorrow night he's julius julius caesar the next night he's romeo the next night he's richard the third is king lear real yes he is absolutely real but his reality is john smith the king king lear is just one of the many names of john smith all of our names are the many names of God's presence, the, the many names of the, the, the universal, whatever we're going to call it. Okay, Everything, let me try, let me try not, one not more. Not just us as individuals, but all the names and forms are names and forms of a single unnameable reality. I love that. All the names and forms, the form, I'm not sure about the names, but the forms, all the forms. I, yeah, I completely, that's, that's certainly the vision which, which I'm exploring and which seems to be so beautiful when you, when I, when I go deeply into that's it. That's all that's important, Tim. If we've, if we've arrived at this feeling understanding through different channels, it, it doesn't matter. Our minds are configured differently. We've come through, we articulated it. That's not important. What, what's important is that we, and, and I would suggest that, that everyone in some form comes to this feeling understanding that everyone and everything are one. Yes, I think there's two separate things here. One is that, which is like, like I said before, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, yeah, I mean, the whole of my life has been yes, I, 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 I trying, know. trying my best yes. to serve that. And really, I'm not a philosopher. I'm a love junkie, and everything I do with people is about is about that huge love. Everything. Um, and then there's a separate thing, which is about actually understanding, which governs how we how we live that love partly is what it is how we live that in this evolving so you know, i don't want to get into all that again well, i want to try one more idea on you if you will indulge me um because i'm fascinated to know what you think because you you came out as a as a god man so i'll come out as a god man um and more and more it, you know it was very important to me when i had my first awakening when i was very young then i lost it in kind of non-duality and it was all like oh that's just relational and and then it came back the the the, the assumption that i found in myself was that god was a name for the ground from which everything had come the possibility which i'm finding more and more attractive 
is God is not where this comes from or where this is going. That actually the whole universe, what this is, is being, this oneness, in the process of becoming in ever more emergent ways in which what happens now is built on what happened then and now and now and there. It's, and it's, so it's emerging in greater and greater ways through all of these up into psyche. And that actually what's happening when we become conscious of the one as individuals is that we're coming together in something greater than ourselves. And just like all the cells in this body commune to create Tim, we are as individual psyches or souls communing to create something greater than ourselves, which is the universe conscious of itself. And a bit like Tim started as an egg and then flowered into a body and then was conscious and with a psyche, that the whole universe is doing that. And that the thing that we have a relationship with, that being of love, that immense being of love, is the thing which is emerging through this process of becoming from the simplest of beginnings, which is simple being. Well, simple being is, is a, um, a, a, a term that I would just use for God's presence, infinite, indivisible being. It's another name for God. Infinite, and I would add, of course, infinite, indivisible, self-aware being. Right. Okay. So there, I think this is probably a great place where we've ended up. We've been talking for an hour and we've ended up, I think, through God, in a, bizarrely, at maybe uh, leaving us with the difference as well as the similarity. I think the similarities are obvious. And the difference maybe is let's that... Let's focus on the similarities, Tim. Yeah, well, we will. We'll definitely do that. But let's just get clear about the difference too, because they both matter. They both matter. And, and that difference is really interesting because of where it leads to, of how you approach everything. Because, and I'm not, I don't want to debate it, I just want to state it so that I can get it and you can get it and anyone listening can get it, is that your, your, your description of God a simple being and then self-aware for me it feels like that's too much at the beginning it's too you've took put, put, you know, it needs to be the very simplest thing and that the god i experience is not just self-aware it's full of love it i it, quite it, agree okay. it's it's it 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 has intelligence it it, it it's it's it has wisdom. It's like the whole, it's like the wisdom of the whole universe is in it. And so that's why it feels like that's where it's, as that has grown, that's what it is. So it's come from what you're describing, but just, I wouldn't say self-aware and turned into the same thing, but self-aware so that the journey is from unconscious oneness through conscious individuality to conscious oneness. Okay. So That's, there's a slight difference in our views, but but it's not it's not a problem. It, it's, it's not a problem. No, no, no. I don't think anything. Uh, because the implications, um, um, uh, the implications are the same. Uh, I, I don't see I don't see much difference in the implications. Uh, oh, well, we shouldn't go through them again because I think obviously I I I feel like. That I personally, I felt that the implications were significant enough for me to make what has been quite a difficult transition. I mean, I've kind of left behind 34 of my books, so that's quite a big shift. I see. Okay. Okay. Um, it felt pretty significant to have to do that. Okay. No, but, sorry. I didn't mean to uh, undermine. Um, no, no. I know I, no, you didn't. I think what you're trying to do is where I would like to end up as well, which is that, 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 that what we're trying to do is the same thing. And that's why it feels like this kind of interchange is worth doing. But Tim, can, can I ask you a question? This, this change that, that you've had, you've left behind your, your 34 books. And, and um, so, so now, what, what is, in, in terms of your moment by moment, everyday life? Yeah. Because that's, that's what's really important. Yeah. It's not, it's not our ideas, how we formulate our ideas, how yeah. we've arrived at ideas, how our ideas have changed. What, what matters is, how do we lead our lives? Yes. And, and in fact, going back to the 
the two original questions you asked, which I reformulated in terms of um, what is the nature of reality? Yes. How may we find lasting peace and happiness? I suggested that these were the two fundamental questions that the non-dual teaching addresses. But I think there is a third question, and that is how should we live? Yes. How do we live? And yes. When I when I um, when I'm interested in in someone, if if I want to know how they really think and feel, I, I don't have a conversation with them. I hang out with them and spend some time with them. Absolutely. Doesn't mean to say I'm observing them and, and just and no, no, them. I know exactly what you mean. Of course, it's a feeling thing. It's the quality. Yeah. I, I have I have friends who um, have never thought. Um, as analytically and rationally about these things as you and I have done, don't subscribe, have never attended a meeting, never read a philosophical book or a spiritual book. Or, uh, But I'm thinking of a few people in particular. To, to me, they are exemplars in, of, of the non-dual understanding in terms of love, intelligence, the way they... And, and I would never dream of, of um, speaking non-duality with them. Or, or, or I also know people who speak all the correct uh, kosher non-dual language. They've got all the right ideas, whether they formulate them in terms of consciousness or awareness or being or whatever it is. And uh, so it, I, I can't fault what they say, but, but when, I'm, when I'm around them, at a deeper level, I don't get that feeling that that's not a judgment of, of them it's just that i i don't feel that what is being spoken comes from the depth of their being i feel it's something that's been acquired and learned through knowledge and meetings and, and but i don't feel that be, and that's what i'm interested in uh, so uh, i would say I, people often ask me i'm sure they ask you you know who's your greatest teacher and without a shadow of a doubt the answer is my mum, who was one of those people everyone around her just felt it and knew it she yeah. didn't read any books yeah. she read my books but she'd have read them if they were on train spotting <laughs> and and uh yeah just was it she just was it yeah. there was no need to think about it so i completely get that i also think that we play different roles so one of the things that you and i are doing is articulation and yes. therefore we have a duty Absolutely, yeah. Play out these articulations and yeah. find the best one. For, for those of us like like you and I that like to explore these ideas very rationally and very analytically, and 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 then in in our case to speak about them and write about them, then for for us it is absolutely appropriate that exactly. we do. I'm not I'm not exactly. knocking that. Obviously, yeah. like you, I spend my life, yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, speaking about these things and writing and, and everything. But it's not it's not essential. And in the end, I yeah. think the formulation the the only purpose of the formulations is to take um to take one to to the to the not just to the, to the felt and lived yeah. understanding and that's i think my answer to your question which was has it affected your life i think is what you were saying and the answer is yeah it really has it's i didn't expect it but it's been a, as significant a jump in a different way than the, the many other jumps, but also particularly the non-dual jump of like, yeah. oh, it's all consciousness. That same feeling of, I saw it this way before and now I see it this way and it's this. And so the, the sense of oneness is, I wanna say it's, it's not the same, but it is the same perhaps, but it, I, yeah. it's just there's a, there's a jump into a communion with the being, with, with the being of, all, of all, with all beings. And there's a, and then there's a rooting back. What's bi the biggest thing that's changed isn't the oneness and the and, and the love that comes with that. It's the clarification of the journey of Tim, and the role that plays within it. That I would say is the, is is the, is what's excited me about it. And and to be honest with you, Rupert, I mean I'm just discovering it's just happening now and literally, you know, literally this morning and last week and it's been going on for a while now, but a few yeah. years, but. So I, I don't know. I can articulate it very well. So yeah, no, no, I, I apologise as all you know. Um, um, but uh, yeah, the, when I said at the beginning of the conversation, it, there was an irony that we connected now of all times. Um, that's because it's the volume has been turned up in it. And for for you know, if you even go back to my last book, let alone the ones before it, I'm trying to synthesise them together. I can see this new thing is getting born. I'm desperately trying to synthesise it with a consciousness based 
view because yeah. I love it so much and I'm, I've invested my life in it, for God's yeah. sake. Tim, Tim you, you're on your track. You're, you're on your unique journey, just like every single one of That's us. Right. We all have to take our unique journey, That's right. our unique pathway. And your journey has taken you and is now re, re, you're re-evaluating everything, reformulating everything. I, 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 think it's, I think it's perfect. I would never want to argue with that or interfere with it or, I, or anything. It certainly it, didn't feel wrong. You're, you're doing exactly what you, what you should be doing. And, and it, it's beautiful. And, uh, and I'm really grateful to you for finding some time. I mean, I've watched you since the first time we've met. I've watched you become probably the leading spokesman in the West for non-duality, I would think. Certainly the most articulate. Um, and that's been good because, uh, you know, if I put my critical hat on, I don't feel that always with people who are articulating this. It worries me sometimes. I, I have a lot of non-dual casualties come to me. Yes. A yeah. lot. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because it messes people up. Yeah. No, I, 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 I agree. Um, and the place that you've brought up twice, actually, in our conversation very powerfully and pulled us towards uh, is uh, the love. And so that seems like a... So I love you. Yeah. <laughs> I really, I really do. I love, I love what you, you bring to the world, Rupert. I love, and it's even better when I'm actually connected with you. Yes. Yes. No, I, I feel the same way, Tim. And then just going back to our first, that first meeting in uh, Ticignano in Italy, when it, whenever it was, that, that, that was, it was because of that quality of connection that I, that I said yes to this interview. Quite often, I'm sure you do, you get quite a lot of invitations to, to, to do this. And, um, you know, I'm I'm less and less interested in um, debate, debating non-duality w- w- with people. I, I'm interested in um, I'm not really interested in ideas uh, uh, ultimately. So, and it was because of the quality uh, of our of our original um, connection that I thought, yes, I would love to have this conversation with with, with you, Tim, and I'm very very glad to have done so. Um, well, enjoy the rest of lockdown. Lovely, thank you. <laughs> and uh, and we will. We to... will I'm sure our paths will will cross again. Uh, um, in, I hope so, but I hope so. This time, I can I can give you a hug afterwards, or at least shake your hand, yeah. uh, or, or or touch your elbow, or even yeah. even. Well, for now, for now, a virtual hug. A vir- yeah, indeed. And, and um, take care. Lovely to lovely to talk with you. Give too. my love to Ellen and. Um, to me. Of course, certainly. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.